I'm going to welcome to the stage our fireside chatter. So let's give it up. Big round of applause to Rohit Kumar, founder and CEO of Chapter Apps Inc., and Laura Baxter, CEO of the Voice of Leadership and Castle Mount Media, GMBH and Co. Come on up. <laughs> Take us on a journey all about this artificial intelligence in education. Now, there's quite a lot of chairs here. I'm going to ask the guys to come up if I can get some help and maybe remove some of these chairs, move it, pick a chair, any chair. <laughs> Looks like there's no hotel staff, it's just us all alone. Enjoy. Great spot. All right, take it away. If the floor is yours. I'll be back. So, AI. That's fun stuff. This picture, I created this picture in about 10 seconds by asking Midjourney, please give a picture in the style of, of the city of Dubai in the style of Monet. And that was created. AI is one of the most one fascinating things happening to us in this day and age. And we're thrilled to be here. But I think maybe before, before we get started, to tell a little bit about ourselves. Rahid, why don't you begin? Well, thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you, Education 2.0, for having us here to share our thoughts on something that probably is the biggest revolution in the last 30 years since uh, the internet came along. Right? The bra I still remember when the browser, uh, Mosaic browser, which became Netscape, and eventually we all rely on browsers every day and to where we are. So um, my background is I'm a technologist, um, a product innovator. I became an entrepreneur after having spent 20 plus years in Silicon Valley um, and in India in, in tech companies from Oracle to Microsoft uh, to uh, Elsevier, which is a publishing company because the worlds of content and technology are really coming together in ways in which we would have never imagined. So the last nine years, I've been actually uh, starting uh, out on my entrepreneurial journey on digital learning platforms and now knowledge platforms with AI. And from my side, um, as far as my background, also from my side, thank you to Edu Education 2.0. It's a thrill to be here and to be able to, to to share ideas with everyone here in this room. From my side, my background, background is I'm a singer, an opera singer. And I taught at Duke University in the States before touring with the National Opera Company and then going to Germany. And there I teach at the university singing and speech and I work with executives on their leadership presence. In addition, I'm the CEO of the publishing company Castlemount Media. And when it comes to AI, I'm not the uh, expert that Rohit is, I am more the user, so to speak. And I see how both we as a publishing company and also our authors are using AI to our advantage and they have the risks and the opportunities that are offered with it. So, having said that, let's get started. Before we get started, Rohit, this is your area, <laughs> more than any, any, anyone in this room, I believe. Um, with your background, being from really during the, the boom in Silicon Valley, being in the middle of it with Oracle and other, other, uh, other projects, other, other companies as well, um, to your work today in creating apps using AI. How would you describe what is generative AI as opposed to, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty, I apologize for that, it keeps jumping around. Um, We'll leave it there for now and go back in a minute. Um, so how would you describe generative AI as opposed to AI and as opposed to, um, for example, big data? Absolutely. I think if you just go back three years ago, the world, what was classified as AI for most of the last uh, 50 years was around algorithms, scan, artificial intelligence, algorithms, power, different tasks. And so we saw a lot of deep learning like uh, chess you're being played by computers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Watson research at IBM, et cetera, as examples of that. And uh, 
in terms of simple chat bots that uh, companies started building were using something called dialogue flow and it was painful to create it would cost a lot of time and effort to make those uh, it didn't create any answers it was what you programmed the machine to do in most cases generative ai actually is uh, the closest that tech has reached to a human being where it generates its own opinions and answers and while it's revolutionary, the challenge uh, that we are all grappling with is, will it create wrong opinions or misleading opinions? And we mm -hmm. obviously, in the course of the discussion today, we'll talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and do you see as far as the, in general, with generative AI, um, well, I think we'll get to the, pre the question of whether or not it's going to be useful or not in that sense, I think it'd be good if we go ahead and just talk about what opportunities that AI offers us, yeah? yeah. I, th I think AI offers us uh, tremendous opportunities. So if one looks at how in just six months of being available, how it is changing industries, right? Uh, just a few minutes ago, Rachel talked about marketing, right? Copy editing, and mm -hmm. I, I think it is impacting already how you as a practitioner okay. of uh, or a publisher is uh, leveraging or thinking of leveraging AI mm -hmm. for copy editing. Uh, if you think about the world of marketing, right, there are um, companies that are creating search engine optimization tools using AI, creating LinkedIn posts. I'm on the advisory board of a company called, uh, uh, on a product called lily.ai, mm -hmm. which creates uh, LinkedIn posts for you and creates marketing content for you. Um, I'm looking at several other uh, platforms which are uh, being used, whether it's ChatGPT powered or alternative uh, model powered companies, which uh, are impacting how customer service is being rethought through, how mm -hmm. even sales online is being rethought through. So it's this, and how education is, is going to be impacted is, is really a big thing as well. Oh yeah, very much so. And the different forms of, of generative AI um, one of the things we were talking about earlier is obviously with writing itself, it's one of the larger, that's one of the larger areas or the areas in which we've made the most progress. But you've also got generative AI in the music business, which also affects my work greatly <laughs> as well. <laughs> and you've also got it in video form, all, yeah, audio is with the music as well. Um, there are just a lot of different uh, types of AI that, that are really going to be uh, developing in the future. In fact, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, how it's impacting the world of music and even the world of art. I mean, you started with a Monet, <laughs> yes. uh, right? So I'd love for you to share your perspective on this. Yeah, I think that's also how it affects us in education more than anything else. I mean, you mentioned about copywriting. In the publishing business, in the writing business, um, AI is, is very advanced, and I think there are so many, uh, so many usages that we have for AI in positive sense. We'll talk about some of the challenges in a minute, but um, certainly copywriting. Also, for example, with our authors, if they've got writer's block, you can go put something in, in, in an AI program, it does not have to be J chat J GPT or whatever, just to kind of get your thought processes going again. It is, however, not a substitute for that. And in the arts, in the arts, you're getting, it's getting there. It's, it's not to the point where you can say that AI is actually going to replace an artist at this point because you have to go through so many different iterations of any, of any given um, prompt in the AI system. But let me see if I can go back with this now. Okay, we are back there, very good. So we started with this, this picture of Monet. But one example in education that we can use, uh, and one way that we could use, um, use AI in education is actually to improve critical thought in our students. By taking, in this case, the, the program Mid Journey and putting in the prompt, give me a painting in the style of, and putting in some painter like Claude Monet. And 
then you can discuss with your students what are the differences in this, this piece of art that AI has generated and the real paintings by Claude Monet. And why did the AI come up with this idea? Well, for example, this one is in the style of Dali. What makes it in the style of Dali? What is surrealistic about this painting? Or in Mahida Omar, what are the aspects of this, this painting, the way the colors are used, the way, simply just the way, um, the way the graphic is in the painting? Or Bansky, Da Vinci. This one's also interesting. I wanted to ask you about this one. I left this one in, but if you look very closely, the text is actually incorrect. It makes no sense. And that will happen often when you're doing, uh, when you're generating a visual with AI. Is there aspects of the, of, the, of the picture that actually work very well, and then there are other aspects that don't. So for example, in this case, we've got the circle. Okay, they're thinking about Da Vinci's drawing of a man, et cetera, et cetera. But then it adds this text. And the text is clearly not, does not make, it looks like Latin, it looks wonderful. I look, you know, said, is there, what could it be? But how, why does that happen? <laughs> You're the person that can answer that. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, this is called hallucination, right? Uh, which is, uh, if you Google hallucination impact on chat GPT or any other AI model, it makes up answers, right? And it's created something. I mean, there are examples where it is, if you ask what is the, stock market performance of NASDAQ versus any other index, it may be throwing out wrong data because no one is validating. So uh, that's hallucination. hallucination. Uh, several companies in the Valley, uh, in Silicon Valley and uh, research uh, institutions have documented it's about a 15% hallucination rate that's being done by ChatGPT or uh, other equivalent uh, models. And the only way to solve it is to add something else on top of it called a truth checker, right? Which will basically either reject something like this or force the AI to go back and come back with something that it, the truth checker has to be trained to be, it's like, like a professor, right? Mm -hmm. To say, no, no, this is wrong, right? So, so that has to be put into place uh, for these models to work. So it's like as if we were having a hallucination that somebody comes in and says, you know, that's not reality. Okay, very good, very cool. And you also, the other thing you'll notice is with illustrations, if you try to do with Midjourney or other programs that do um, AI-generated pictures, you'll notice if you do people, they're often very distorted. So the hand might have six or nine fingers as opposed to five. So it's, yeah, it's, that's also, I guess, an example of hallucination, okay? And, and the artist may not see anything wrong in it because the artist could have freedom, right, to say, I was, you know, drawing a person with nine fingers. Mm -hmm. it's, you may think it's not possible, but you can't stop me from my creativity, right? So from an artist's viewpoint, that's fine, but yeah. how does it impact how it's used elsewhere mm -hmm. could, be a, could be a bigger issue. Yeah, very true. Just a couple of more pictures. This is Dubai in the style of Picasso. And again, to talk to your students about why. What are the, you know, what are the differences between Picasso's work or what makes this, this Picasso S? Or Harajuku, bringing in a lot of different styles or influences in a piece of art. In the music world, um, it's a very similar situation. We, you've got AI programs that compose music. And I was actually sent by my daughter a composition that was written in the style of a lot of different composers, which was actually rather amusing. You can use the same thing with a music student, with a composer, to say why. Why is this in the style of Bach? Or what makes this uh, Rachmaninoff as opposed to Dvorak? It, so you can use that to help them think more critically about music style. Traditionally, in music education, we just look at Bach. We learn how he composes fugues, and you have, it gets a little, you, you talk about the Baroque composition style, but this actually enables us to, um, to ex fully expand that in a way that was not possible before. So do you think, uh, 
AI can take role, take over the role of a prof professor teaching music? No, <laughs> I don't. No, I really. I, don't. I think people would love to hear why, right? Because I think everyone maybe maybe worried about this because this is half the media articles today is can AI replace this? Can AI replace this? Etc. So there's just a lot of fear that I see as with any new technology. May I quote you on this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what he said when we were discussing this um, before we came to Dubai. Um, oh, I should let you, you quote yourself better. It basically, AI is not going to be what replaces you if you do not in, in the future. The people who replace you if you do not think about AI and begin to incorporate AI in your work what will be replacing you are the teachers and professors who are using it. Because the, our job as educators is really to learn as much as we can and to see how we can use this to help our students. It's not to ignore it, it's not to say this is not, you know, this is, this is not safe, this is going to take, our, take, um, take the role of you know, my job. Yes, a computer can be trained to sing. A computer can be trained to sing opera. It's not going to take the role of the human on the stage. That human element is so very important. And, and we, don't, we should not ever forget that, ever, especially not in education. Our students need us. And so the most important thing is not to think about, as I said, the fear, but to concentrate on how can we use this to our advantage and how can we use this, even more importantly, to our students' advantage. And I should attribute a, a former colleague and a friend of mine, Jaspreet Bindra, who is a professor at Cambridge University on AI, who actually said uh, broadly, uh, generative AI will not take your job, but people who use generative AI will take your job, yes. right? And if I was to sort of just say in the world of education, uh, educational institutions and research, um, let's say a professor is given an assignment to students to come back with something about Dali, mm -hmm. right, and Dali's works. And uh, the student who would have spent a little more time on Chad, on uh, Midjourney or similar tools, and come back with a critical thinking thesis around it would score much better in the professor's view than someone who's just uh, done it without doing a lot of research. So I think how re libraries, resources are being used for research, this has huge implications in how we all marshal the resources, leverage AI, and really develop the human thought process to a much higher level of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I agree. There's one other aspect or one other thing that I think could be that we can use AI for again for this critical thought development and I know you also have an app that I'm very curious to hear about I've not, not I myself have not yet heard as much as I'd like to about this um, I think I've got another picture here and that is yeah hello history another AI platform where you can actually write and have a conversation with a, with, with an historical figure so you can write Shakespeare and ask questions about, so how are you today? And what have you been doing? And whatever, what, however you want to ask it. So your students can ask these questions and then you can actually discuss with them, was that really Shakespeare? And I don't mean was that, it was clearly not Shakespeare, but although sometimes it feels like it is. Um, you can then ask, actually then ask, you know, do you really think Shakespeare would have said that? And then you can discuss with them why maybe this, this interpretation by the AI is not quite, uh, not quite what we, we would really say, and then you can t talk about the historical context of that person and, and, and their lifetime. So there are many things that you can use AI for in that aspect. How, what are some of your ideas as to how to use it? So I think first, uh, AI can be, uh, I'll just add a couple of sort of uh, limitations that currently uh, AI has. All the, all the free or paid tools that we are using has data from the internet that has been put into these models over the last several years. Not all the information exists. And obviously, Shakespeare could be hallucinating also, right? Which he probably did in real life too, but we'll never know, right? Uh, so um, I think in terms of how it could be used, um, 
in, and let's talk about publishing as an example because you brought that up. So there is a tool called Jasper.ai mm -hmm. that is actually helping reduce the effort a copy editor needs to do, right? Uh, it's reducing the effort even an author may do at the beginning, right? And, and that's going to change how publishing the, the whole industry works. And I know a little bit about this industry uh, because after having spent 10 years in it, uh, one can see uh, how the old processes, you know, now have a chance of being completely transformed using di digitization and AI. I think if I look at the workplace, um, how you train your employees, or how, how do you make awareness campaigns, how you create uh, uh, knowledge bases so that people can benefit from them, and how they leverage it to do their jobs better, be it customer service, be it um, uh, sales, be it online sales, um, and, and how it impacts the rest of the functions in each uh, organization yeah. are, are important aspects. Yeah. One other, since you were mentioning publishing as well, is translation. Many of our authors um, have written in another language and want to translate their works into English and then have it published internationally. And um, this is where you see, again, limits. So they will often put it into a publish into a translation program using a combination of big data and AI. You still absolutely, and we all know this from what we hear at least, but it's still worth saying, you still have to have human eyes, a human translator go through it because it can start hallucinating and not usually in the first three chapters. And that's the fascinating thing. It starts around mid book, all of a sudden you've got a situation where the, the translation is the opposite of the original. So it's really, you still have to be very careful with it and you still need human eyes. So I was recently reading a report uh, released by BCG, uh, mm -hmm. the Boston Consulting Group, about AI and impact on uh, our world. And it, uh, I'll just quote a couple of points. It said, it's going to lead to humans supervising AI as a first draft. I think it's very simply but clearly explained. You know, exactly to, uh, on your example, if you've got uh, AI to do your translation, that's a first draft. Yeah. Someone has to still go through it, and that person may be more experienced um, than a typical translator. On the other hand, it's, uh, people were anyway using Google Translate to get the first draft. Mm -hmm. So it's replacing Google Translate in some ways, right? Except that it's actually doing the whole paragraph, not just the words, right? And it's uh, going to augment human creativity, yeah. right? Definitely. Because that's, that's the big use case that's going to come out. All of our translators use AI programs as well to assist them because it makes it go so much faster. It's, it, it remind, it, if you think about when we went to doing um, language check programs, so in, in, in Microsoft Word or whatever, whatever word program you're using, and all of a sudden now you've got a, 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 a grammar check and a, a spelling check that just makes it so much easier to take the next steps. And AI is just basically the next step in, in general. Um, and there's another, we also, another use of AI which I find fascinating. One of my uh, uh, clients that I coach for her TEDx talk, Karina Papavici, she's a, an entrepreneur in Switzerland who has a company, Art Recognition, which uses AI to be able to tell if your art that you've got, <laughs> that we all have at home hanging on the wall, <laughs> if that's actually legitimate, if it's, a, if it's really an original piece. And you take a picture with your cell phone and send it to them and their AI, um, they have many, many different artists and programmed into their database and they can tell if in fact that art is an original or not. And that's it's fascinating. Yeah, you know, what the possibilities are endless in in so many ways. I mean, absolutely. I mean, if you go back 30 years ago, when the World Wide Web really started coming into reality, and how uh, till the year 2000, everyone felt that it was going to take away a lot of jobs. Look 30 years late or 20, 23 years later. Look at Dubai. Look at Asia. Look at India. Look at China. Look at Vietnam. Look at how these countries have grown. So if anything, the World Wide Web has made a lot of things possible to spread uh, wealth around the world, to create development around the world. I think AI is, 
is just another thing that like that that will happen and some jobs will go away but new jobs will be created and the overall uh, output of humanity will be much better and we hope the world becomes a better place because of uh, being able to get the right things done faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how would you say that, um, that corporate itself is thinking? So we have some people who work with leaders in the corporate world. Um, how, what do you think they're thinking about AI as far as growth? Well, I think every CEO around the world is thinking about how to use a generative AI. Uh, in a way, and, and most CEOs are n not that tech savvy because they're, they come from, they're people managers, they know how to run their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so they are all wondering about how we will use it, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, and I think if we can just switch the camera, I'll show you a little bit of a bot that could be used from a sales or a service uh, angle. And Shobit, if you could uh, just flip the, the screen to the bot. Yeah. Could we just put in a question? Tell me about the GM EV platform. Yeah. So, we, you know, we, what we've done in this model is just uh, taken a f about 10 pages from the General Motors electric vehicle website and put it in here. And here, uh, it basically comes back with the answers of, uh, you know, what the platform is about, some key features on it. If you were to go to the website, it's more tabular, it's, uh, you know, more sections on the site, and it's coming out like this over here. And here in this model, um, uh, there's a truth checker model built into it. And as I'll go into the next couple of questions, I'll show you how the truth checker works. So let's type what, what vehicles are available with the Ultium platform. I think let's just select that one. Right, so now it's giving us answers about uh, the various models, uh, the various cars that, that have uh, this platform. And we can add, um, you know, it's prom prompting uh, two, three questions as well. Um, and so if you just say, when will these vehicles be available? If you just type that, or, yeah, just click on that. I don't know what the answer will be to this, but here, most likely, because there's no information on the website about availability, right? So it says, I don't understand, can you give me some more details, right? And if you just click on the blue link, show related content, this is where the truth checker, um, you know, it did get an uh, answer on the website saying this particular vehicle was available for pre-order, but it wasn't sure, right? And so it basically has rejected it. And this is where I believe the role of the people who will uh, train the bot for anti-hallucination will have to play a role, right? And this is built by our sister company, Gaurav.ai in Silicon Valley. And we have built our solution around it because we believe that getting accurate answers in the workplace, accurate answers for research is very important. Otherwise, we'll end up with the Da Vinci image with things that look like Latin, none of us know Latin, or at least most of us in this room don't know Latin, and we, we would think it's real, till, till someone who just knows it will say this is all wrong, right? So, so I think this is just an example of how uh, companies will think about how do we use this for sales, how do we use this to augment our customer service force, uh, how do we get 24 by seven customer service, how, how do we build conversational experiences in a way in which I can retain my customer, I can upsell them in another car, upsell them in another product from my own company. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. So, we can. so we've talked a lot about the positive sides of AI and you can tell that we are both rather excited about it and actually enjoy working with it. What are some, we talked a little bit about the negative, you asked about the fear. What are some of the downsides, the risks or challenges, I guess? Well, I think uh, the most obvious downside is that 
can there be a spread of misinformation or can people make wrong decisions based on wrong information that's spun, uh, you know come out of um, a chatbot right and some student could submit wrong assignments and 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 say it but but the tool that you gave me in the educational institution gave me this answer so therefore it must be correct right whereas today in a library you'll never get that answer that i i tagged this reference and it was, you know, uh, it was incorrect, right? So I think that level of, uh, that could be one aspect that could go wrong. I think the world could also become a very highly polarized place. Uh, but I'll, I'll also add to, to my opinion on this, right? Which is, um, when the world really started using the internet, uh, schools and uh, educational institutions started teaching people how to search and get right answers. It wasn't, it's even today, it's ha half the information on the internet may not be true. For instance, if you're searching for health, I mean, if I search for, I have a pain in my knee, I mean, I could end up thinking I need a knee replacement, whereas it might just be a little muscle pull, right? So uh, how it is used is really where I think the biggest fear and the biggest opportunity is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other kind of to, to follow with that, one of the other things, because of the polarization of our societies um, in today's world, some of the first results that came out with the chat GPT and all the hype about chat GPT, um, there were a lot of people that uh, then would go into a conversation, a chat bot, with chat GPT, and it didn't take long. I think in one case that I read about, it took 19 seconds before the AI started to get rather aggressive <laughs> and rather insulting and start saying or start writing things like all humans need to be destroyed and things like that. Um, the most important aspect behind that, I mean, many people got very emotional about that and thought, oh, this is a sign that AI is going to take over the world and kill us all. Um, I think that's a little bit far. Um, for me, it was a sign of the sources, the data sources that were being used had that kind of language in it. And I think that, first off, the data sources that are used, and it's really important with every, and you can say more to this in a moment, with every tool that we use, using generative AI, it's important to know what the data sources are for it. Because that determines what's going to be, what information will be generated. And I think that language coming from this non-entity, this AI program, shows, it, it puts a very large mirror up to us as a society and to us as educators. Because I think one of the things that it shows is more than ever before, and we were talking about this at lunch today, one of the things more important than ever before is to teach ethics to th teach good values to our students so that so that hopefully in the future AI produ produces a little more positive results but also so that they can recognize the good from the bad it's one of the biggest differences between humans and generative AI I think uh, it'll never replace human consciousness. If anything, it's probably meant for us to elevate our own consciousness, right? Of being able to tell right from wrong. I mean, you, whether you see your pets, like animals, they also know what's right or wrong when they've done something wrong, right? Uh, human children, human beings know what's right or wrong. It's, it's to make sure that we don't lose that discerning, discernibility to say, I know what's right, I know what's wrong. If it doesn't look right on what AI is telling me, mm -hmm. then I need to do a little more research on it. Yeah. yeah. I think the other thing, you had asked earlier about the arts, about music, etc. One thing that we humans have that generative AI doesn't have is creativity. And what I mean by creativity is the ability to create something from nothing. With Generative AI, it has to have a data source. So it will, it has its limits to what can be created. And when you're really genuinely talking about human creativity, not, not just thinking out of the box, of course, that's one aspect of it, but really 
creating something new out of nothing, that's a human quality. And it's important to respect that in us, that we, we still have that ability. Um, there are also other aspects of the human existence or the human experience. I sing. A sound a, like voice can be generated by a com computer, but it is not the, a computer cannot have the experience of singing. It does not have the mechanism to do that. And so there are things that are very unique to our human experience that are important to respect. Absol uh, absolutely. I think it, I'd love to see what the audience also thinks about some of these questions that you and I have been uh, discussing here today. Um, so, yeah. We're going down to the yeah. audience. What do you think? Uh, we love uh, that good. Idea. You love like it? it? Okay. I gave you extra time so we can get this interactive because this is too fun. I mean, really, you can get dizzy with the amount of AI stuff that's out there that can really impact your day. I'm going to bring the mic around, let everyone kind of engage. Okay. Please introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Sakha, CEO of uh, Motivation and the PhD student doing AI in medicine and arts. So somehow they are related. But I would like to comment on uh, uh, AI. They don't have a creative. So recently, we can hear about uh, the um, guns and cans model, which is generate an art from nothing, from no data or reinforcement learning, so the model or the machine learning uh, model that could learn from its mistakes. So I think the one way that the machine or the algorithm that couldn't beat the human yet, which is the motions. For example, in my opinion, if I stop in, in a piece of art, I can feel a story behind this art not generated from resources or from no emotional art. Uh, for example, so I can imagine and have um, like the story behind this uh, artist, how he create or she create this art. But most of uh, these recent uh, resources for AI in uh, art, it generated the, uh, uh, the art from uh, the input from the audience. So that's make uh, artists, from my opinion, never be replaced or even assessed because each one of them, they have their own story and their own journey for creating this piece of art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I you love for sharing. That. Save the arts. Inshallah, right? Another comment. Did you have anything else to respond for that one? Okay, another comment. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Girija Shankar from Mars Intellectual Services, uh, UAE. Uh, nice talk, nice discussion. It has its pros and cons as we discussed. Uh, and we can continue on this subject, I think, for another couple of hours. But uh, just one quick thing, when you were speaking, rang, I mean, reminded me, uh, two days back, I was watching a web series on Netflix called Guilty Minds where uh, AI is being used, exactly what you said your daughter did and showed to you, using few keywords, a musician's name, few keywords, and ask the music, the producer, what length of music you want to generate, and it generated within seconds a music for about four to five minutes. But it goes, the, the uh, lyrics is uh, resembles a real original masterpiece that was being created by a musician and it is being debated in the court about plagiarism and all. So same question I want to pose to you when your daughter brought it to you and showed, what was your take on that and how did you educate her for, uh, for future use, utilization of this technology uh, to go ahead? Because we are discussing on the plus and minus sides and during lunch, we were discussing on the same thing, how children use AI for, uh, you recall? Yeah, uh, yeah. so how would children use the AI for uh, preparing their project reports and all. So what's your take on that? And how did you answer to your daughter on that? Or you, Mr. Rohit, can uh, enlighten the audience on this. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> That's going to be, I think, one of the biggest challenges involving AI is to figure out who 
what is to figure out the copyright elements of it. Yeah. And obviously, and I think it's one of the negatives we did not talk about and that we're finding in publishing as well, that the copyright element, be it music, be it writing, art, who owns it? Who created it? Um, I put in, there were one or two of these pictures, I did a second iteration. It was my idea to do the iteration. Does that now belong to me? And same with the music. I created the, the text or the, the general melody. I, it's, I, I have no answer, but I find it fascinating and I don't know how we're going to answer it, but go for it. <laughs> well, I think it's, a, it's a really a test of the intellectual property and copyright yes. laws around the world, right? And um, I used to actually be part of the copyright committee um, in the publishing industry in India. And the biggest challenge was who, you know, whoever has filed a copyright, have they given, have they said it honestly and correctly? Right. And I think it, this is going to put more pressure on that. And one of the things that will have to be asked, I think, in any copyright submission has to be, did you use AI to generate any aspect of it? I think that will become a big aspect of any copyright uh, matter. Right. Because if it, if it is, I mean, I don't and, and I will obviously we we cannot take the precedence of what finally happened in Guilty Minds with whether it was a copyright violation or not. Uh, but I think attributing the source to uh, AI, and each time, in interestingly, if you were to ask the AI each time to generate a response, it'll be slightly different. It will not, never be the exact same response, at least on generative AI. I've worked some, with some excellent jazz musicians who can't do the same improvis improvisation <laughs> twice, too, so it's a fascinating subject. And it remind, the question reminds me of, I was at a symposium at BMW, uh, living in Germany, on, on, on self-driving cars. And it's the same, same situation. You're talking about AI that's, that's actually causing the, the car to be able to drive alone. If an accident happens, whose fault is it? Is it the person sitting in the car who doesn't have their hand on the steering wheel? Is it BMWs? Is it, is it, is it the software developer? This, this, this type of legal, these legal clarifications are going to be one of the biggest areas for us going forward with, when it comes to AI in general. Thank you for that. Just to co follow up on that question, the conversation we had was about a mother whose teenage son wrote an article for school using ChatGPT. And the technology was so advanced that the teacher put the article into ChatGPT and said, is this a copy written by you? And the ChatGPT says, yes, <laughs> got, the, got the child. So they're actually, I think this is what's happening now because everyone thinks they're smarter than this technology. But there's going to be a window of that gray area. You have a question, sir? Yeah, question. Yes, yeah. please introduce yourself for the room. Uh, thank you for your presentation and the uh, discussions. Uh, I'm from, uh, I am Oba, so I'm from, uh, I am uh, assistant professor in University of Japan. So uh, that's why so I, so I, I'm working at the university. So uh, you talked about, uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, AI in education. So uh, we are now so every day discussing about that. So, <laughs> for example, so uh, the university is a little bit very um, freedom uh, organization. So that's why the students and the faculties and researchers are using such kind of the chat GPT based uh, kind of the chat AI. So for the studies and researches, it's very helpful and supportable for uh, sophisticating the ideas and for them making uh, the sentences like that. So, however, the uh, the elementary school and high school are very uh, uh, different mm -hmm. from such kind of the university's education. So uh, my question is about them. Uh, should schools, uh, including high education, take uh, more time and focus on the ability to utilize or designing, management, decision making based on AI, uh, even more than the traditional knowledge based uh, studies? But uh, maybe the, uh, some of the uh, speakers talked about the designing uh, of STEM uh, and STEM are uh, also this is the same topic, I, got, I guess, so that. So, uh, uh, so I'd like to hear your <laughs> opinion about that. So just to make sure I've uh, got the question right, it's about should uh, universities encourage students to use AI as part of their research work and curriculum and study? Is that, did I summarize that correctly? Yeah, 
Sorry, Rachel, if sorry, you Sorry, I'm going, yeah. I'm going, I'm going. All right, row hits on me. Okay, sorry, could you repeat just so that they got the question clearly for you? One more time. Did he get the question right? Okay, so can I, can I one more time? One more yeah, time. Just, yeah, just, I just want to confirm that I've understood the question correctly, which mm -hmm. is that uh, should universities encourage AI in research and the, as part uh, not, of the... Not, not the research one. I, I'd like to hear about an elementary or more, uh, high education. Not, not, not so high education. Yeah. Middle yes. school, high yeah, middle school. school. Yeah, middle school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, 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 two. Your thoughts about middle school and how they're using AI in education is coming from a university, right? So you're yeah, talking true. about this every day. Yeah. So how, what do you think? So, What's your take yeah, on the middle school? Yeah, of course, yeah. AI-based education is very supportable for knowledgeable. So maybe the education system is itself uh, is so uh, innovative, I guess. Now, the, maybe the time uh, schedule for the education in elementary school and junior high school and high school are completely different before. Uh, it is. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. The, I guess so. The, so, uh, and also, the, so you talked about the use of the AI and the, such kind of utilized uh, ability or uh, the, 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 of, uh, the last session, so the speaker talked about the designing itself. Yeah. So also important for, uh, I, I, I uh, understand that. So should such kind of the ability to, <laughs> such to utilize and designing or using AI or more uh, important and to take more time for uh, their classes. In, in the lower level, in, in, in K-12. In K-12. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in the school. Um, I, um, well, I, I think, uh, again, if, if we, what's the alternative? If we don't, the students will use it. They will t try and cheat on their homework. But on the other hand, if the school system, and, and this is just my opinion, tells the teachers that use AI, one, ask students to report that they've used chat GPT for their homework, right? But also, Give, give an explanation of why the answer was written the same way uh, by ChatGPT, that may start developing more critical thinking tools. Um, and the other thing that would happen is that the teacher, assuming it's the ChatGPT subscription, let's say, uh, that the teacher would have, uh, the school would have subscribed to, the teacher can see what each student would have asked. So which students are actually using it and saying they are, will lead to a better sort of, a, in my mind, a more uh, transparent system so that people are able to think again. What is the end goal of education, right? It is to think and to apply, right? And, and to do whatever you want to do better than you could do earlier. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, with chat GPT, you can also say, please give me an essay at the eighth grade level or sixth grade level or whatever, and it will come out sounding, you know, like, an elementary school or middle school child. Um, I think the, the answer to it is much more personal contact between the teacher and the student. And as you said, it can, it can be used as a tool to improve critical thought and discussion. It would require that we have enough school, enough teachers, and good teachers that are really willing to take the time with the children and do an oral exam in addition to a written so or in addition to just having them write an, write an essay at home, um, just to make sure that they understand what they were writing or copying or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And um, that brings, of course, a, a new challenge, which is in many countries there's a shortage of teachers. And that needs to be addressed. That's, and, and the education of teachers and making sure that they understand how to use these tools is very important. Great. The utilization of the teachers is, I think, where he was going, of how they're going to be enabled to encourage their classroom participation. Question over here. Okay, so mine's not as much as a question, as a burning feeling right now in my heart Ooh. that I don't really agree um, as much with what's being said. And I've been listening to the words of, you know, we had lunch and the child you know, the teacher caught the child and there's words coming up like, you know, cheating. And I'm really questioning, is that our job as educators? Are we policemen? Are we detectives? That's absolutely nonsense. It's because our focus is so focused on catching out the kids. Because our focus is so knowledge-based that we live in fear that we might be replaced by AI. 
I do hope AI replaces all teachers on Earth. And I hope that we can get learning facilitators and learning guides into the classrooms. If you really think about something like Bloom's taxonomy that asks us to ask higher order thinking questions, if we change our questioning, the output will be different. A lot of the questions are how, why, who, when, where. Those are the basic lower level questions. So that teacher that said, you know, um, I caught the child, I caught out that child for cheating. Well, actually, A, I caught you as a teacher for not teaching, for not facilitating the skills, the values, and the attitudes that are needed in the classroom. So if anybody wants to further this conversation with me, I'll be here for the next two days. Love it. And Get up there, say your mind. I go love it. AI. You know, this is great because it does challenge our base. I saw your hand back there. I'm going up there. Thank you for that. You know, uh, it challenges our way of thought. Do you love it? Do you hate it? There's two sides of the story. You love it or you hate it? Well, I love it. And uh, my name is JP Bhatia, and I am uh, I own or I am the CEO for Load and Code, where we always go ahead and create more solutions in education also. And uh, one of the primary solutions with everybody works with uh, for schools is a learning management system, which we do. We also work with EI and AI both. Now, a very good uh, you know uh, discourse was just now told about in the favor of AI or uh, discussion which was happening right now. Now my uh, testing, when I did uh, testing of uh, chat GPT recently around 15, 20 days back, was that you know I asked a question uh, in two different methods, like how our uh, you know moderator told. So my question was first, and okay, let us go ahead and uh, give me a 1,000 uh, words uh, essay on uh, XYZ topic. And then again, I went ahead and uh, requested information about give me a thousand word uh, essay without plagiarism on the same topic. The output was absolutely different. But again, when you go ahead and uh, you know your teachers would like to go ahead and go to chat GPT and because of the you know LLMs, uh, different chat GPTs are being used everywhere. So all of them would have a different database to go ahead and answer it. It's not only one chat GPT what we are talking about. So at the end of the day, how you are going to go ahead and ask the question and the intelligence and the intelligence quotient of that particular student also has to be so much high to go ahead and ask a question in that intelligent way to go ahead and get an output which is unique in nature. So you cannot go ahead and call any particular student that he has been cheating or he has been doing something wrong. But instead of that, when you go ahead and talk to any of the technology people, they would say, I do not want to go ahead and study something which I can go ahead and get in 10 seconds as an answer from Google or maybe 3 to 10 seconds from ChatGPT. Why do I have to go ahead and take that education is a question which is nowadays coming up. So that is, the, that is, that is where we are moving towards. We cannot stop that, but we need to go ahead and understand that teachers can go ahead and become better guides at any point in time. To go ahead and guide them in the right way, to ask the right question, to go ahead and make sure what they are getting from chat GPT. Whether that is true or not, because chat GPT can give you anything as per your question what you are you know, asking from it. Good, good point. What's your question? So we can wrap right. this up. So the question is, can chat GPT go ahead and give me truth every time, yes or no? Good question. Can ChatGPT give you truth? Yes or no? Well, at the moment, no, right? At the moment, 14 to 16 percent of the time, it hallucinates, right? Can it be there in a few years from now? Can it be there next year? I think the way technology is improving, it will get there. Um, like I showed, there was something, you know, there are multiple companies trying to build a truth checker. Godot.ai is one of the first ones to have the truth checker there. Uh, to do this, but I think I'll, I'll go back to your bigger point because I think I, I did want to share this with everyone. You know, in, uh, in when I was studying engineering, we actually had something called an open book test. So the professor would say, bring your textbooks to class, bring whatever you want, and I will put a problem, and you will all have to submit your submission, and I'll give you four hours, or I'll give you eight hours. 
right? Again, with all the resources at our disposal, there were people who, who could barely pass the, you know, the exam, and there were students who did really well, and the ones who did really well really understood the concepts. So I think chat GPT and AI and other models uh, like that are taking us to the world of an open book education, right? right? Apply your mind, learn, get the concept right. So I think, and to go back, I think, was it Maya who said about, uh, uh, you know, making us uh, learning facilitators? I think that's the way, direction I truly believe we are headed in as humanity. Yeah, yeah I would like to actually say with this, the, the um, next to the last speaker, I think there was no disagreement there. What you said is exactly what we've been saying. Um, but I would also like to say we should be patient with each other and with ourselves because this is new. And so if colleagues are approaching it in a different way that you may not, disagree, you may not agree with, then open a, a conversation and ask questions about what they think possible positive uses of AI could be because there are so many possibilities. And of course, there are challenges. We, we recognize that too. So. Thank you. Absolutely. Take a round of applause. What a great fireside chat. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Rohit.